open your Bibles back up to the fourth chapter of the book of Romans. We're going to continue what we talked about this morning, talking about why works won't work. And this morning we talked, uh, number one, about works uh, promote self-glory. It makes man boast of his own self-righteousness instead of pointing uh, for his own sake and for the world's sake, pointing to the righteousness of Christ. And I got to thinking today about the, the most uh, impacting story about boasting that has happened in my life. And some years ago in the late 80s, uh, my father owned an RV business on 11th Street. And it was called McGraw RV. And while we were there, I, I was his office manager for a little while during that time. And we had a young man come to work for us who worked back in the shop. And he was a fellow who had about shoulder-length hair, and he's about that big around. His name was Kevin. And Kevin, whenever I think of boasting, I think of Kevin. Because when Kevin showed up, uh, you would have thought Kevin was uh, the hottest thing since sliced bread. Because Kevin, any subject you talked about, Kevin was an expert. Kevin was uh, the best at. One day we got to talking about, uh, about softball, and Kevin said, you don't want to play softball with me. Because if you ever pitch the ball to me and I get a hold of it, it's going over any fence in that park. But wow, we're not going to play. He doesn't look like he can do that, but he sure is convinced that he can do that. One day we got to talking about running. Kevin said, you, you don't want to race me. I can't ever remember being beaten at running. And no matter what subject we talked about, Kevin would say, no, you don't want to get involved in whatever that is with me. And so one day, our shop manager, who was about as slow as my cousin, and he was about as slow as you can imagine, raced Kevin and, and uh, beat Kevin. And Kevin said, well, I got a bad start. So right there, we started to think that maybe all that Kevin's saying is not, not reality. Maybe it's reality to Kevin's brain, but it's not reality to what, what is real in the world. Well, one day, finally clinched it. One day, we were standing up in the front of the store, which looked out over 11th Street. And of course, 11th Street is the safest Avenue in the city of Tulsa, and it was in the 1980s as well, and there happened to be a car accident out front. It was just a little bumping of two cars together. They pulled across the street, and one car had uh, one gentleman from somewhere in the Middle East. You could tell it was that, that, that much from him. The other car had four young black men. Well, they both got out of their cars and began to talk about this altercation that had happened between the two automobiles. Well, that went on for about five minutes. And then for the next five minutes, the uh, man from the Middle East was running circles around the car with these four black men chasing him. And then he spied our business across the street and headed across the street, dodging traffic. And then the four black men came across after him, dodging traffic with, with cars squealing and screeching. And, and then he got right in front of our door. And you know, that morning when I had opened the gates for the, for the RV vehicles, which were behind the fence, I had noticed this, this uh, weapon on the ground. <laughs> it looked like somebody had been killed with this the night before, so I didn't want to put fingerprints on it, so I kind of just left it there in case the police showed up and asked if a murder weapon had been seen around. I couldn't even describe it. It was some kind of pipe or, or some kind of long thing. Well, this guy spied it. He grabbed it, turned around toward these young men crossing the street, and backed his way into the store. Well, Kevin was up front, and our salesmen were up front, I was up front, and our salesmen, whenever it gets a little slow, they like to practice their putting. And so there's putters up there in the front of the, the store. Well, he comes in, this, this Middle Eastern man comes in backwards holding this. These black gentlemen come in, and of course all the sound and the argument comes through the door with them. Kevin is standing by the door. They all come in beside him, and he just starts moving this way away from the door. These uh, young black men see the putters, grab the putters, and so you've got a standoff in the middle of our RV storefront. And, and so we're trying to get them divided up, getting them back out of the store, uh, calling the police, trying to get this taken care of, while Kevin is just kind of moving farther and farther and farther away from this, this altercation. And finally we get them out in front of the store. And they head back to their vehicles, and they're gone before the police get there. And as soon as it gets quiet, and everybody's kind of thinking through what just happened. Kevin finally speaks up after 10 minutes of them being in there and says, if they would have shook that golf club at me, you can't imagine what would have happened. 
Kevin was the farthest one away from anything, any involvement in that. But Kevin had an empty boast. And Paul is saying to the Jews, you have this great boast. You think you are the, the hottest people in this world as far as righteousness is concerned. And you're going to be surprised someday when you find out that that boast is an empty boast. And they may not be seeing it, but Paul saw it. And Paul this morning said, well, let's, uh, let's go beyond that and look at what Scripture says. Because they had convinced themselves that Scripture said, well, Abraham is the, uh, the greatest evidence of what righteousness is all about. And Paul said, well, let's talk about Abraham. And Paul looked in the Old Testament and, and pulled out Romans chapter, what he quotes in Romans chapter 4, and it says that Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. It says nothing there about Abraham doing any other work than simply believing God. And again, this morning we talked about how that was a point when Abraham was wavering in his faith. He was struggling. He didn't see how he could have a child being as old as he was. He didn't see how his wife could participate in having a child as old as she was. All he could think about was his servant, his oldest servant, Eliezer of his household, that God could take him and use him as a descendant to bring all these, this ancestry about. And God said, no, look at the stars. As many stars as you see, that's as many descendants as you're going to have. And Abraham thought about his circumstances, how impossible they were, and yet he looked at God's promise, and he chose to believe God's promise. And God said, that's all I'm looking for. I'm looking for people who trust me at that level. No matter what your situation is, this is my promise. This is what I say I'll do for you, regardless of your circumstances. And when we trust God, then God says that equates righteousness. So that's where righteousness is determined. So we have, have works promoting self-glory, number one. And number two, works contradicts Scripture. Scripture actually says, Paul says, what does Scripture say? Well, it says that Abraham believed God and that God accounted that or reckoned or put it to his account as righteousness. Now, beyond that, we're going to look tonight at two other things. Starting in verse 4, we're going to see that works eliminates grace. You can't have grace and works at the same time. Verse 4 says, Now to the one who works, his wage is not reckoned as a favor, but as to what is, is due. Now, if you go apply for a job and the employer says, You know, we want to hire you here. I'll just give you a check. That's a favor. That's a gift. But if you show up for that job and you work for two weeks and the employer says, I want to give you a check, that's a wage. That is something that you have earned. Paul says, now the one who works, his wage is not reckoned as a favor, but what is due. And verse 5 says, but to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. God has made a promise. God has said that he will justify the ungodly based on what Christ has done. No work on our behalf. And that is the basis, the foundation of what the gospel is all about. Grace is unmerited favor to those who have not earned it. Christ earned it, but God puts it to our account based on what Christ has done when we believe, when we take his word and trust it. And works eliminates grace. It eliminates that possibility in our life when we think we are working our way into God's favor. This one little phrase, justifies the ungodly, believes in him who justifies the ungodly, that doesn't shake us up too much, but that would shake up the Jew. Because they, in their theology, they never saw God ever justifying the ungodly. Their heroes were the godly. They God justified because they were such wonderful icons of righteousness. They saw Abraham as always doing the right thing, and that God justified him because he was the best of his time, and Noah was the best of his time. But here's this phrase that God justifies the ungodly. The godly don't need justifying. The ungodly are the ones who need justifying. And you think about the ministry of Jesus. When Jesus condemned, who did he condemn? He condemned those who thought they were godly. He condemned the Pharisees because in John 9 he says you're not even able to see your own sin. They said, are we blind too? Because the whole, whole chapter is about a blind man being healed. And he says the reason they're blind is they don't see their own sin. No matter how much they think they see in the law or are, are trying to keep up with the law when they don't see their sin, they miss the most important thing that they need to see. And Paul is saying that the only people who are justified by God are those who recognize their sin before him. He goes on to say, he who believes in him. Abraham 
constantly believe God. If you look at the life of Abraham, it's a consistent believing and trusting God at one level after another. If anything was going to be on Abraham's tombstone, it would probably be that portion of this scripture, but believes in him. Uh, Genesis 12, God called Abraham out of the Ur of Chaldees. He believed him. He responded to that. Genesis 15, Abraham said, I'm too old. My wife's too old. Take my servant. God said, your descendants are going to be in the stars. Your servant's going to have nothing to do about it. Abraham believed God and trusted him. Genesis 17 and 18. You know, Abraham believed God in Genesis 15 about he was going to be participating in this. And if you remember what happened between Genesis 15 and 17 and 18, Hagar comes into the scene. So Abraham tried to achieve that descendant without Sarai being involved in it. Genesis 17 and 18 God comes to him and says, no, you're going to be involved in it, and Sarai is going to be involved in it as well, who later would be called, called Sarah. And Abraham believed God at that point. The child was born. God tells him in Genesis 22, take this child, he's a teenager now, take him up to the top of Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. And Abraham followed through on what God had asked him to do because he believed God, that somehow God would accomplish through this contradictory thing that God would still accomplish what he was aiming for. And if you remember what happened when they went to that mountain, there's so much there that is consistent with what happened with Christ as well. They uh, left the servants at the bottom of the mountain. Uh, you know, Christ's disciples uh, deserted him. Uh, he put the wood on Isaac and Christ uh, carried the cross. And then Isaac got to the, to the top of the mountain and he said, I see the fire in the wood, but where's the sacrifice? If you remember what Abraham said, he said, the Lord will provide for himself a sacrifice. But literally, it, it says in the Hebrew, the Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. That was prophetically in the understanding that the Lord would become ultimately one day that sacrifice for us. And here's this hundred plus year old man and a teenager. And in the same sense of Christ, willingly gave himself over to the Father's will. This teenager who could have run and would not have been caught allowed himself to be placed upon this altar before God's involvement allowed uh, an ulterior sacrifice to be provided. And Abraham trusted God. And God saw that as being righteousness. So works eliminates grace, but trusting God allows grace to flood in and for God's involvement to be active in our lives. Well, I want to go to the last point tonight, and this is what we'll finish with. Uh, number one was works promote self-glory. Number two, it contradicts Scripture. Number three, the reason why works won't work is that it eliminates grace. And number four, works deny God's righteousness. It opens the door for man's righteousness to be involved, but it denies God's. God tells us that our righteousness is as filthy rags. It is unacceptable. But His righteousness can only come when there is no works uh, happening in, in a particular situation. Romans 6 says this, Just as David also speaks of the blessing upon the man to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works, then he gives this quote from David. And for those of you who were not here this morning, Abraham, I mean, Paul is pointing to the two, two greatest heroes of the Jewish faith, of Jewish history, to prove his point, to Abraham and to David. And now he's starting to talk about David. And this is what David said in David's psalm of confession. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Blessed is a man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. You know, I heard some uh, sometime back about a wealthy English businessman who owned a Rolls Royce. And he was driving through France and he had car trouble in a Rolls Royce. And so he called the company, and the manufacturer flew somebody to his destination, and they came there, and they fixed the car, and then they returned. And he was expecting them to send him a very sizable bill, but they didn't do that. And time went by, and time went by, and they still had not sent him a bill. So he called the company, and he called them, and he asked about the particular situation that had happened. And... The company said, we have no record of anything having gone wrong with your car. And he understood later that the Rolls-Royce company refused to acknowledge any imperfection in their product. So they would, not, they would not respond to any kind of question like that. 
We don't often want to acknowledge any imperfection in us as well, but apart from recognizing sin, and here's David recognizing the sin in his own life, and remember what it took to get him to that place. After he committed the sin with Bathsheba and allowed Uriah to be killed, God had to allow havoc to happen in his family, him to get physically sick, and finally when Nathan came to him and said, Thou art the man, he was willing to admit it. But it took that long to get him to admit the imperfections of his own life. But apart from that, apart from recognizing we don't have our own righteousness, it's only filthy rags, we can't participate in the righteousness of God being placed on our account. David was a liar, he was a murderer, he was deceitful, he was an adulterer, and the passage we're looking at tonight talks about David's confession. And in this passage, he talks about these lawless deeds being forgiven, being covered, being not taken into account. And that is consistent not with the way the Jews thought in their theology, but that is consistent with the gospel, with God's forgiveness of sin, with the righteousness of God coming to our account instead of our own failing righteousness. Now, suppose... Uh, Bill, you were going to buy me a car, okay? And you had $50,000 you wanted to spend on my car. And I'm not sure what kind of car you, what kind of car can you get today for $50,000. Uh, I know you can get better than a Toyota probably or maybe a, a what? Like you drive, right? Give me one just like Laverne drives. But to get a car like that, and maybe after you bought that Lexus and you handed the keys over to me and I got to thinking, that is really too big a gift. I just don't feel right about you giving me that expensive a gift. So I want to participate in the cost of that Lexus, and I'm going to give you 50 cents to help sway, to offset the cost of that Lexus. And then I got in that car and took off down uh, Memorial, and somebody stopped me and said, that is the neatest car that I've seen in a long time. Where did you get it? And I told them that me and you went together and bought that car. Now, how would you feel about that? That would be an insult, wouldn't it? And it's an insult to God. When we say, me and God got together and achieved my entrance into heaven. You know, God wants all the glory. God deserves all the glory. He doesn't want us participating in that with our little piddling. And the Jews needed to see that they, did ha they had nothing to offer with regard to righteousness to put into the cost of what it would take to get into heaven. And, you know, that wasn't a simple thing for God to do. If, turn around again, maybe you owed me $100, and I decided, Bill, that I was going to forgive that $100, uh, for me to forgive that $100, I would have to absorb a loss of $100. It wouldn't be an easy thing to do. It cost God to forgive us. He had to absorb the debt of sin, the cost of sin, which was the death of his own son. So it's not a trite thing at all that Christ absorbed David's murder, his adultery, Peter's denial, Paul's persecution of Christians, he absorbed your sin, he absorbed my sin. He took all these things, they fell upon Jesus Christ, and the Bible tells us they've been cast into the deepest sea, they've been placed behind God's back, they are as far as the east is from the west, and never meet, never to return to confront us again. That's what God has done through the gospel. Because if one half of 1% of any of our sins ever came back to our account, we could never end enter into heaven. It would make it impossible. It takes that much to include the holy, to pollute the holiness of heaven. And we pay, we don't get to play in a lot of muddy fields because they always call the games off down at Hagee Creek if it even sprinkles within three days of a softball game. But I have played some softball games on some dirty, dirty, muddy fields. And I can remember a tournament in North Carolina where they, they didn't, it was at the end of the softball season, they were just going to play that that tournament no matter what, and we were out there knee, you know, knee deep almost, at least ankle deep, in mud playing that tournament. Imagine playing like that and getting dirt all over your clothes and all over your cleats, and then going home to your house and not taking anything off at the door, but just kind of walking through the house like normal, sitting on the furniture, going on the carpet. You know, what would you look like 60 seconds after the, the lady of the house found you, polluting it like that? And we think we're going to trounce into heaven with all this that's offensive to God still attached to us. David is saying, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven, covered, whose sin will not be taken into an account. You know, there are times when we get offended, maybe by somebody, and 
And for the rest of their life, somebody can hold something against another person. And they never treat you the same or trust you the same, maybe as they did before. But God, it says here, completely cleanses our account. And there's nothing left there of our offense against Him. In fact, He refills that column with the righteousness of His own Son. So when He looks at us, He doesn't see any remnant of what we once did. He doesn't even see an empty space. He sees everything consistent with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's why our position before God is one of being very pleasing, why we can come before Him with boldness, because we come before Him with all that Christ has accomplished being put on our account of the favor that goes with it. Well, starting in verse 9, let me quickly uh, close. There's a few questions that Paul asks. In verse 9, he says this. He says, Is this blessing upon the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? Is this for everybody, just for the Jews or for the Gentiles? And then he answers it. He says, Faith was reckoned to Abraham as righteous. How was it reckoned? When was it put to his account? While he was, he was circumcised or uncircumcised? This is probably something that you need to think about. Not while he was circumcised, but while he was uncircumcised. In Genesis 15, when God accounted righteousness to Abraham, that was 14 years before he would be circumcised. And so, by all practical terms, Abraham was a Gentile when God credited righteousness to him. That was a shock to the Jews. In fact, Abraham lived 400 years before the law was ever given. What about circumcision? Verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised. It says circumcision is two things. Number one, it's a sign. A sign is something that points to reality beyond itself. If you were a stranger and, and coming to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and you got to the sign that said Tulsa City Limits, and you stopped there and you got out of the car and you took a picture of yourself by a Tulsa City Limit sign, got in your car, took back off to wherever you came from and said, I visited Tulsa. Oh, you visited the sign. The sign was there to point to a re bigger reality of the city that was beyond the sign. Circumcision in itself was just a sign to point to hopefully a changed heart, a circumcised heart, a bigger reality beyond it. In itself, it was just a sign. Secondly, it was a seal. Seal is something that's a permanent reminder. And it says here that it was a permanent reminder, a seal of something that he had before he was even circumcised. When we get baptized, our being baptized points to something that happened before we were baptized. While we were yet unbaptized, something happened in our heart. And when we're baptized, it's to point back to that. And our baptism is to be a permanent reminder that something happened before the event of baptism, uh, we underwent that. And then you have a third question that he asked. Uh, what about the law? Verse 13 says, For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void, void and the promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is no violation. The law was never meant to be a mode of salvation. The law was to participate in it by directing us to our need of Jesus Christ, by showing us that we fall short of God's righteousness. And the law here, he says, apart from faith can only lead to wrath because it judges us and it shows us our condemnation. And if, when we recognize what the law says about us and we don't turn to Jesus Christ to save us, then the law will condemn us. It will lead to wrath. Imagine a kid coming back from college and bringing all this dirty laundry that was standing in the corner for about the last six weeks of his college life before he came back and brought it home for Christmas, brings that all back and drops it in front of mom and says, aren't you glad I'm home? I mean, this, that part of that, that child is not the, the part that makes you glad that they are home. You know, that's the filthy stuff. You do love the child, but that is not why. And we'd like to bring our filthy laundry before God and make God somehow accept that and God wants nothing to do with our righteousness. He calls it filthy rags. So why is saving faith? Well, Paul is saying it has nothing to do with the law. It has nothing to do with legalism. Verse 12 says, The father of circumcision to those who are not only of the circumcision, but also who follow in the steps of faith of our father Abraham while he was yet uncircumcised. 
You want to find your right path to God? What is saving faith? What footsteps do you follow to reach a relationship with Jesus Christ? You follow Abraham, but you don't follow him through the law. You follow his footsteps of faith. The footsteps that he demonstrated to us while he was yet uncircumcised. When God confronted him and said, this is your circumstances, yes, but this is what I ask of you. This is what my word, my promise is to you. And do you believe it? Will you accept it? You take the word faith. You divide it up into letters. Make an acronym. Number one, if you want to find saving faith, you need facts. The facts that Jesus died for you. The facts that you're a sinner. The facts that, that Christ's blood covers the guilt of our sin. That Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. That we can walk in newness of life. But you also need to agree with those facts. Accept them as truth. And then you need to internalize them. Personalize them for your own situation. If this truth that you agree with, the set of facts is something that applies to your situation. And then you need to step out and trust. And trust God. Make a total commitment. Step out in faith and rest all that you have, all that you are, upon Him. And realize this is not just for a moment, but this is your hope that you have for a lifetime. A hope for eternity. Now, Paul said in Romans 1, you studied it in Sunday school this morning, that, that we, you know, faith to faith. Faith we're saved, faith we live each day. As Christ saved you, so we're to walk in Him as well, Paul said. And that's what saving faith is all about. Eternal life is something that begins and never ends. It's something that, that uh, it's a quality of life. It's a quantity that never ends, but it's a quality of life that we live with each day. That Christ is alive in our life and we're living by faith, trusting Him by faith. And uh, Abraham demonstrated that as well as he believed God in the midst of impossible circumstances. Now, I might ask you tonight, what impossible circumstances can you think of in your life? Because when you came to faith in Christ, you believed the impossible circumstances that God could take away that account of sin as He promised to do and to replace it with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But again, today you have a similar decision. That God can give you the power over a particular uh, habit or something that's confronting you in your spiritual life. The Satan's getting the victory over Demonstrating faith, following in those footsteps, is something we exercise every day of our life. And that's what saving faith is all about.